This is the first in a series of several programs with regard to estate planning. And for right now, here in uh, 2020, we're going to focus on not only the general aspects of state, pl estate planning that we all need to know uh, at all times, but also try to give some insights as to how estate planning is somewhat different now in this time of COVID. My name is Dennis McAndrews. I am the founder of McAndrews Law Offices. Uh, we are located in Berwyn, Pennsylvania, and with other offices in Scranton, Wyomissing, Wilmington, Delaware, Georgetown, Delaware, and Alexandria, Virginia, together with Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, with me today is our supervising partner for Estates and Trusts, Leslie Mihalik, who has been our supervising partner and a valued member of our team here for many years at our firm of McAndrews, Mihalik, Conley, Hulls, and Ryan. So today we're going to start off by talking a little bit about how we can simultaneously plan for today and for the future. And I'm going to turn it over now to Leslie to start that process. Hello. <laughs> okay, so obviously this has been a time of great flux for all of us, and we have um, been meeting many different challenges. So we're actually starting with a topic today that is something that does remain certain, and that is taxes. Um, Really, since 1997, the federal estate tax exemption has been all over the map. It's generally increased since that time, uh, but we it has been as low as 675,000 all the way up to the current exemption today, which is um, over $11 million per person. Um, obviously, the exemption today is quite high um, is since it is over 11 million per person. And the law also has a feature today called portability, which means that basically two spouses can get the benefit of two of those exemptions. So with relatively straightforward planning, two spouses can pass over $23 million free of federal estate tax today. However, the current law as it is right now was only put into effect from 2018 through 2025. So it is set to sunset right now at the end of 2025. Um, unless Congress act, acts before that time to extend this law, it will sunset and the exemption will right now go back to the pre-2018 levels, which is basically $5 million uh, per individual uh, as increased for inflation. So, you know, a few uh, points to make about this. Uh, right now, uh, when we have this very high exemption, the IRS has specifically come out and said that if you make very large lifetime gifts right now while the exemption is so high, if in the future the exemption goes much lower, you will not be penalized for that. So you will still get the tax benefit of having made that very large gift. So it is something to think about right now uh, because this could be a very unique time in history while we have this exemption as high as it is. Um, there's still a large amount of uncertainty about what the future of federal estate tax will look like. Certainly as administrations change and uh, as we face budget issues in the country, we certainly could be looking at a different outlook down the road. So the gifting is something to just keep in mind. And then additionally, uh, one planning technique that we utilize in a lot of estate plans is called a disclaimed property trust. This is a very nice trust because it provides a lot of flexibility. A lot of planning that we do in the estate planning world is irrevocable, meaning once you make a gift, it is fully made um, and you can't just take it back uh, without having some tax consequences. However, the Disclaimed Property Trust is an optional trust that is specifically designed to provide some flexibility and it can be very useful uh, in a world when we just don't know what the outlook is going to be many years down the road. So the Disclaimed Property Trust uh, provides that when one spouse passes away, 
the surviving spouse has the option to fund this trust uh, with assets that are passing from the deceased spouse. So it could include one half of joint assets, or it could include assets that were just in the deceased spouse's name alone. Again, the surviving spouse has the option of whether to do this. So even if we put this type of trust into your will, uh, it is not mandated that it be used down the road if the exemption is still uh, as high as it is today. However, if the exemption goes down significantly, this really might be a trust that the surviving spouse would want to utilize. Monies that go into the disclaimed property trust would grow um, and at the surviving spouse's passing many years down the road, hopefully, uh, all of the appreciation in that trust that had accumulated during that spouse's lifetime would pass uh, to her heirs free of federal estate tax. So it is a very useful technique uh, that really can get a lot of money out of the surviving spouse's estate. Um, Again, in the right circumstances, this is a trust that can truly provide a meaningful and straightforward way uh, to limit the federal estate tax. And of course, that is a tax that we want to avoid at all costs uh, because it does come at a very high rate, uh, currently as high as 40%. Uh, so it is a tax that we want to do everything to avoid. The, th this topic that uh, Leslie's been talking about in our outline we call simultaneously planning for it both today and the future. W one of the issues that we deal with frequently is families that either go too far or not far enough in terms of planning for the future. Uh, some families want to literally manage their estate from the grave and, and have layers upon layers of uh, permutations, computation events that could be extraordinarily unlikely to occur. And they talk to us about putting very extreme circumstances in the will. Uh, and there are times when that has to be taken into account. At the same time, it can create a will that is unduly complex, complicated, and sometimes difficult to interpret and actually have uh, an opposite effect of what the, uh, the client wants to do, which is to try to ensure that wishes are met. And sometimes by, by uh, trying to predict so many even extraordinary circumstances and inserting language into the will, it can actually create opportunities for, for people who are trying to uh, actually inject ambiguity into the will and to allow for uh, a will contest. So th there's, you know, th there's a point at which we have to allow the executor to have a meaningful discretion to deal with unforeseen circumstances in the future. You want to prepare as much as you can. As John Wooden said, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. At the same time, we can overdo it. It's everything in moderation. So we want to look at the, at the future eventualities uh, that are likely to occur and deal with those. And those that are remote typically try to leave to the uh, executor's discretion about how to handle those remote circumstances or sometimes not worry about them. It, it, that can actually be an a, appropriate uh, result of, of a meaningful discussion. And we see that sometimes now with COVID where people are trying to plan for the eventuality of getting COVID right away when in fact their situation may very well be such that they are young, they are healthy, the likelihood of dying quickly uh, and, and trying to, uh, to create a will that plans for an, a very quick death can, again, stand in the way of a more rational approach. So what we try to do is we try to look at when we meet with the clients, what are the likely circumstances to occur? And can, how do we plan for those likely circumstances? And are there remote circumstances that are better off left to 
uh, the executor perhaps in his or her discretion, or uh, avoid getting into them too deeply because it can actually create ambiguity in the will, which defeats the very purpose of the extensive planning. So the second area that we uh, <clears throat> wanted to talk about was internet sources. And, and this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, topic right now, because with COVID-19, people are understandably and appropriately looking at their estate plans and, and taking stock of where they are in their family, where they are in their future planning, what their needs are in terms of uh, the future for their loved ones and how they can best see that their estate is managed. Uh, with that fact of people paying more attention, understandably, to estate planning right now, uh, a number of uh, companies that promote internet wills are very aggressively uh, marketing. And uh, to be sure, we have seen internet wills that fill the bill. We've also seen them that are disasters and actually cost the estate more money than if they had hired counsel. By the way, our fees are on our website, so they're, you know, we don't hold them secret. Uh, you can go to our website and, and see what they are. Uh, and we have had internet wills which really did injustice to the person's estate. Let me give you an example. Uh, <clears throat> when we draft wills, we attempt to have careful tax clauses in the will. Who's going to pay the taxes? And that especially becomes an issue of concern. When there are jointly held assets that may still be taxable, many times people believe putting property and joint names so that it passes by operation of law, joint bank accounts, joint real estate, uh, uh, and they don't pass under the will because they pass what we call by operation of law. And therefore, uh, people who use internet resources sometimes don't realize that a portion of that uh, asset, which was owned by the seed, is still going to be taxable it, uh, in many states. And particularly in Pennsylvania. Yet, the internet will frequently just says all taxes are paid out of the residue of the state. So you may have one sibling who was put on an account as a convenience to mom or dad in her, uh, his or her older years so that that sibling could pay bills, that sort of thing. Uh, but with the intention, everything would just be evened out upon death. And very little was actually left in the sole name of the decedent uh, to pass under the will. So the one sibling who was paying the bills is getting almost everything under that scenario because it's in joint accounts, passes directly to that sibling. And unless that sibling does the right moral thing and says, okay, I'll get half of it to you. And by the way, there could be gift tax issues <laughs> involved in then gifting that money back. And so there's that needs to be a discussion as well. Uh, but in addition to that, then if the typical tax clause from the internet will is used that all taxes are paid out of the residue of the estate, the sibling that got all the money through the, the uh, joint accounts isn't paying taxes, but the residue of the estate that may be going either split equally between the two siblings or going to the other sibling, that's paying all the taxes even the, the non-probate assets, which are still taxable in the percentage that was owned by the decedent. So that, that's an example of a risk. Also, we often see a designation of an executor or a trustee or a guardian of a minor who is not really well thought out. It may be an instinctive reaction that, well, I should name my older brother. But if you were sitting down with an attorney who might ask some questions about the older brother, like what does he do for a living? And say, well, he uh, you know, runs a casino. 
uh, or, uh, you know, I don't really want to talk about what he does for a living because it's kind of under the table. You know, th th those are red flags for us where we might say, all right, it, is there a better choice? Is there a better idea than that? Uh, so, you know, getting it, some guidance on those issues can really, really be important and far more valuable than the you know, a couple or a few hundred dollars you might save on an internet will. A another example that Leslie and I have seen several times over the years is where uh, there's a choice of picking a guardian for minor children. Uh, one thing that has uh, amazed and I confess somewhat amused me over my many years of practice is when families uh, go on vacation with another family and the other family parents have been named as guardian of the minor children. We get clients coming back from vacation with a frantic phone call saying, I want to change the guardian as soon as possible. I went on vacation with them. I don't care for how they raise their children. I don't want them raising my children that way. And they're uh, literally frantic and they want a codicil to the will done as soon as possible so that they are not going to raise their children. So, but that's the kind of discussion that we have with, with our clients and, uh, and other attorneys do to try to make sure those right people are picked. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, that whole question of how you pick the executor trustee or guardian is it has to be a discussion. Uh, oftentimes it's very clear. It may be, hey, my mom and dad are only 55 years old, 60 years old, they're in great health, they spend a lot of time with the kids, wonderful. Uh, but that oftentimes we hear that we need to split certain roles. I may want my parents to be guardian of my minor children or one sister or brother to be guardian of my minor children, but that person can't balance a checkbook. So you probably don't want them to be the executor of the estate where they have to keep an eye on that sort of thing. Now, usually an executor is going to hire an attorney because there are a number of legal aspects in terms of the probate process, in terms of preparing Pennsylvania estate tax, uh, sometimes preparing a federal uh, income tax uh, uh, return which by the way, oftentimes is appropriately filed, even if no taxes due, to maintain what we know as portability so that the one spouse's exclusion under the federal estate tax will be available to the second spouse to die. So there are a lot of uh, reasons why a discussion of that type needs to occur. Uh, and there are times when uh, we may have one sibling as the uh, guardian of the person of a child and another person as the trustee of a trust for money that's left because you can't live, leave money outright to a minor child. Uh, if you leave it outright to a minor child, they're going to have, this is another foible of an internet will that sometimes doesn't take into account that you need a trust for the minor child. Because if you don't create the trust in your will for the minor child, the court will create one for you. It's not gonna just be left in a bank account for your eight-year-old son or daughter. It has to go into a guardian account, which usually is highly restricted. Uh, you need court approval to withdraw principal. And you're going to be in a situation where you have to hire or your, your uh, uh, trustee of the trust would have to be appointed by the court. There'd be a court proceeding to get that trust created. And then anytime principal is invaded, you have to go to court and hire a lawyer to go to court. And again, this is another example of why the internet wills rarely do everything that needs to be done in a comprehensive manner and winds up costing your estate more money, oftentimes thousands of dollars more money than if you had good, solid, person to person, professional to client advice at the outset. Uh, so many times, you know, we can create that trust so that you don't have to go to court. 
to withdraw principal. Uh, you have a trustee who is selected based upon a skill set, and you've got uh, a solid undertaking to move forward. And it may be that the guardian who takes care of the child, the guardian of the person, the child may be separate a separate person from the trustee because one person's great at raising kids, another person is great at maintaining books and investing. Leslie? Absolutely. Um, the next question we're gonna talk about is coordinating your life insurance, uh, pension death benefits, retirement benefits, all of those assets with the rest of your estate plan. Uh, and we really cannot overemphasize how important and essential it is to check the beneficiary designations that you have on those assets and to make sure they coordinate with your will. I think it's a really common misunderstanding that people have, but your typical life insurance or retirement plan or IRA, it's actually not going to pass under the terms of your will. Your will uh, will allow assets that you own in your own name alone to pass through your estate. But assets that have a beneficiary designation on them are going to pass to that named beneficiary designation as a matter of law. And it's gonna go outside the terms of your will just directly to the named beneficiary. So what can often happen is that you might have one of these types of trusts in your will or your will might designate a trust for one of your uh, beneficiaries or family members. Uh, but unless you make sure that your beneficiary designation on those other assets also coordinates with the will, then those assets may not pass in the intent that you desire. So there are many examples of times when you may choose to use a trust in your will. Uh, just some of uh, a few examples that we uh, do frequently are if you do have a family member with special needs, you may want to utilize a special needs trust for that beneficiary. If you have a minor child, and when we say minor, we're not just talking about under age 18. Uh, we often will do trusts uh, for children beyond age 18, uh, because really an 18 year old still is usually not capable of uh, making the best, most responsible decisions. Um, we have heard it called the Harley Davidson age. So it's usually not a time where you'd like to give children too much money. Uh, so often we'll keep money in trust for those children until age 25, uh, but you could do it longer if you wanted, depending on your assets and the responsibility level of the child. Uh, you may want to put a trust in your will if you have a family member who's a spendthrift, somebody that just needs a little bit more help with managing their money uh, and in a way to uh, keep them from hurting themselves by spending it uh, all right away. There might be addiction issues, so you might want to put a trust in the will for that. You might have concerns about uh, a spouse or potential spouse of one of your children. So you may want to put a trust in your will for that child just to protect that money and make sure that it can be used for the benefit of your child and your grandchildren down the road. So all of these are very good reasons why we may put a trust in your will. But again, you know, we've seen people come into our office with a beautiful will that has a wonderful, very detailed trust spelling out exactly when the money can be used uh, for the benefit of the child. However, if you don't make that second step of checking the beneficiary designations on your other assets, and again, they include your life insurance, your IRAs, 401ks, certain pension benefits, uh, a TIA CREF account, anything that would have a beneficiary designation. What you wanna do is check those designations and make sure that they don't just say the standard, which is often to my spouse and then to my children. If it says that, it's going to pass outright to your children uh, at your spouse's passing. So instead, what you can do is modify that designation to specifically name the trust involved. And if we are working with a client, we will give you the exact language that should be used to make sure that that trust is named. 
Uh, if, for example, you do have a child with special needs and you do uh, prepare a special needs trust in, in your will, it's just really essential to make sure that the life insurance, the 401ks, that they also go into that special needs trust. We have seen cases where a will might have contained a special needs trust and the money passing under the estate and through the will did go into that trust, but there was say a $10,000 life insurance policy that was still left to the child outright. Uh, that can still be enough money to render that child ineligible for public benefits for a period of time. And while we may be able to do planning in order to get that person back on their benefits, it can often be a lot of work. It might be a lot of expense. It often will need court approval as well as getting approval from the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services or your state Medicaid agency. So it's certainly something that we want to avoid at all costs. And we can do that by, by, by doing the preventative planning um, of doing your will, but just making sure that your be beneficiary designations also coordinate with the will. And this is a particularly important time. The, the thing about estate planning in general, and part of the reason that many people put it off is that it deals with our mortality. You know, the, as they say, the two absolutes are death and taxes. And now with so much going on and we're dealing uh, in this country and in the world with one of the most infectious diseases that has come across the human landscape in really uh, a century, uh, it brings to mind our mortality and it makes us think about things that we should think about anyway, which is how do we plan for the ultimate event, which is, you know, when we pass. Uh, none of us generally believe it's going to be around the corner, but it can be. Uh, last night, as we taped this, uh, four people died from trees falling on them because there was a great number of storms that occurred in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, they hit cars uh, in two occasions, hit a house another occasion, and uh, fell on a golf course on someone. Uh, so, you know, it's an unfortunate fact of our human existence that we don't know when and where things may happen. And that is particularly the case now with COVID-19. And one of the simplest and most important things that you can do attendant to preparing a will, which sets out what you want to have happen to your assets when you die, is checking your beneficiary designations. And it's not that difficult. Many times we don't have that handy. Call the agent, call the HR person and say, I need to identify who the beneficiary of my life insurance policy is, who the beneficiary of uh, my 401k is, whatever asset is involved with regard to passing on death, check it, make sure it's what it should be, and it can be fixed so easy. They can email you, mail you, designation form. It takes moments, minutes, less than five to fill it out. And then you've got that peace of mind. And one of the great things about the work that Leslie and I and our colleagues in our Estates and Trust Department enjoy is so often when we finish this process with people and we try to move it quickly, we try to move it as expeditiously as possible. That's why we have a questionnaire on our website that we ask people to send in so that before we even meet with you, we've hit the ground running. We know generally speaking, who you are, who your family is, when you got married, what your assets are, and what your hopes and dreams are. We don't know everything. That's why we have our meetings. Right now, we're doing them by phone or Zoom or however, but that last 10 to 25% is filled in, and then we know everything we need to do so that we can get those documents to you expeditiously. And then attendant to that, is having those beneficiary designations done right. And there's no better time than now. Uh, if not now, when? <laughs> so 
even if you put off doing a will, which we hope you won't, but if you do, check the beneficiary designations because so many times people have gone through divorces or there have been deaths and it leaves great questions about where that money will go and creates heartaches that, that families and survivors truly don't need. And sometimes people think, well, the law or my will will take care of it. It often doesn't take care of it the way you want. And generally speaking, your will can't take care or clean up those beneficiary designations. It has to be done in the beneficiary designations. Uh, so thank you, Leslie, for filling us in on that important part. The, the next thing we're gonna talk about are living trusts. Um, <clears throat> and whenever we do these programs, we get questions about living trusts. Uh, and they can be heavily sold by some organizations, some attorneys. We're not among them. We, they have a place. We do create living trusts from time to time. But uh, most of the time, especially in Pennsylvania, <coughs> there's no need for a living trust to put your assets into a trust in your lifetime. It's done under the guise of avoiding probate. The, the problem is, is that creating the living trust usually takes more time, effort, money, and hassle than is involved in the probate process, which in Pennsylvania is not expensive. And living trusts don't save tax money. So uh, rarely are they necessary unless there is a collection, maybe a second marriage. So think about it carefully. Leslie? Yeah, and I would just add on to that too, that we do see um, some people who have paid a lot of money to have a very long and fancy living trust, but they didn't go through all of the effort to fully fund that trust. So in practical effect, what ends up happening is that um, they still may need to go through the probate process. So the whole point of doing that living trust is to try to avoid probate. Uh, but again, that's only going to be done if all assets are moved into the trust, um, including every bank account, including your house, uh, really any asset that you don't individually have to be moved into that trust to fully avoid probate. So um, it's always a shame if we see somebody who spent a lot of money on this complicated document, but um, it didn't make all of the steps to make it uh, avoid probate. And we're seeing with COVID-19 some heavy marketing about them again. Mm -hmm. And a uh, number of lawyers have actually been subject to discipline for uh, marketing them mm -hmm. and claiming that they have benefits that they don't. So it's a buyer beware situation. There can be circumstances to use them, but I would say in Leslie and my combined probably 70 years or close to it of, of estate planning work, uh, less than 5% of our clients really need one. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah, Pennsylvania, I agree. Okay, um, the next topic we're gonna talk about is another tax topic uh, is specifically for the federal <laughs> tax. Uh, it's the alternate valuation date for an estate. And while this might seem at first to be a little esoteric of a topic, we thought it was really important to include today uh, just because with COVID-19, we are seeing so much change in the economy um, and in all likelihood that is going to continue <clears throat> for quite some time. So we did think it was an important topic to bring back to light. Um, Back in uh, the financial crisis of 2008, uh, Dennis and I worked on uh, several estates where we did utilize this alternate valuation date. Um, and in light of things moving forward, it might be something that uh, we're really using a lot more again now. So what it is, is, you know, basically when a person passes away, the estate is going to be subject to tax 
there is that federal estate tax, which again, today has that high limit, but we don't know uh, if and when that will uh, change and be reduced. So when a person passes away, their estate will be subject to tax and assets are taxed as of the value on the date of their death. So, you know, when the person owns stock accounts, we write letters uh, to um, the managers of the accounts and we find out what the exact value is as of the date of the person's passing. And normally that is the amount that we have to pay tax on. So this alternate valuation date does give you the option if your estate is going to be in that federal estate tax range and if uh, the taxes would actually be lower if you used the alternate valuation date, you are allowed to do it. So it says that you are allowed to look at the value of the asset six months after the date of passing. And if it would make sense if you'd owe less tax because your estate is reduced six months later, then you can actually select the tax as of that alternate valuation date. So if we do have a situation where say the economy was booming and uh, the person passes away and their assets are valued at a very high level, but then within six months, we have a collapse of the economy and the assets are much lower at that point, we could look at everything and try to make a decision as to whether uh, it would make sense to use that alternate valuation date. The IRS offers this as an option, really because if the assets do decrease so much in value, uh, then the beneficiaries of the estate aren't getting that true date of death value. So they don't think that you should necessarily be taxed on it. Some examples where this could really come into play is if you have a family owned business. Um, again, if the economy is booming and you have a small family owned business that is doing very, very well, uh, it might have a very high value. If we have, you know, like where the circumstances we're undergoing today, unfortunately, businesses are uh, going out of business. Some are really struggling uh, and having financial issues. You know, six months, uh, while it doesn't seem like that great of a length of time, a lot can really happen. Um, so this would allow you to look and utilize that alternate valuation date if it made sense. Now, this again is really something that you want to talk to an attorney about so that you can make an informed decision. Uh, if you do choose to proceed with the alternate valuation date, you have to do it for all assets in the estate. The only exception is if they were otherwise sold or transferred earlier, uh, then you have to use that transfer or sale price. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to be selecting it for all assets in the estate. And you do have to look because uh, there can be other ramifications of selecting it. Normally you would think, yes, I want to do it so I get the lower federal estate tax and that might be the right decision. But you do have to realize that, that it will actually uh, change the basis of the assets too, so that uh, in the future there might be other income tax ramifications when that asset is sold. So it's something to be looked at uh, carefully, but certainly in the right cases, uh, it's a very important tool. Uh, like I said, in the cases where we have used it, it has been um, very important and saved a significant amount of tax. And I, I, I would agree, Leslie, that's particularly important at a time like this where you have such economic volatility. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we are in the, the, uh, the greatest uh, loss of jobs, loss of wealth since the Great Depression. That could change, but we don't know. And so where, you know, you have that level of uncertainty recognizing the availability of that uh, is just hugely important and, and shows the, uh, the importance really of, of working with a knowledgeable attorney in managing both the estate plan and the estate. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that only applies for federal estate tax, not for uh, the Pennsylvania inheritance tax. Uh, but again, that federal estate tax has a much, much higher rate than uh, we have for most transfers with the Pennsylvania inheritance tax. 
Um, next, we wanted to talk about why it might be a smart decision to use an attorney in the estate administration process. So, um, you know, it is not something that is legally required in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, you can uh, go to the courthouse and try to probate an estate on your own. Uh, but there are a lot of reasons why it makes a lot of sense to talk with an attorney uh, and hire an attorney to assist you with the entire process. Uh, the first one is uh, just the probate process itself. Um, you know, in many cases, it really is going to depend on uh, the exact will that you have. You know, another thing, uh, as Dennis was talking earlier about those internet wills, um, they may not have the proper documents that they need or the, the proper wording that they need to make the probate process in Pennsylvania as straightforward as it potentially can be. If you have the will drafted in the way that the Pennsylvania law provides, uh, the probate process can actually be much easier. Uh, but if you don't, you have to do additional documentation. Sometimes you have to do a petition um, that you have to bring before the register of wills. Um, so again, just another reason why you want to be cautious about those internet wills. But having an attorney in the estate administration process, we can look at the will, we can quickly identify if there are any issues with the actual document, and we can uh, move forward with the right process uh, quickly <laughs> to still administer the estate and to open the probate estate. A big reason to look at hiring an attorney is so that you can save on taxes as much as possible. Um, there are a lot of little uh, idiosyncrasies involved in the tax law that if you just bring the return uh, to um, you know, somebody who just typically prepares your tax returns, they may not be able to identify them uh, because they are so specific to the estate and inheritance taxes. It's much different than the preparation of an income tax return. And just for example, that alternate valuation date, you know, that's something that could be easy to miss. Uh, in Pennsylvania, you do have the option if you are able to make a prepayment of the inheritance tax within 90 days of the person's passing, you can actually get uh, a discount, a 5% discount. Um, again, that's something that is a date that comes pretty quickly after a person's passing and can be very easy to miss. Uh, so by by working with an attorney, we can uh, evaluate if we're able to make that prepayment and make sure that we get it done as quickly as possible as one of the first things we do in the estate. Um, evaluations for businesses. We're just talking about those small family owned businesses. Um, while, you know, it's interesting because assets, people might want to put different values on their assets for different reasons. If they are uh, looking at gifting it or selling it, they might want a very high value. However, when they pass away and they're going to be taxed on it, they may not want as high of a value. Um, and there's a lot of different things to consider when there is a small family owned business and when we are determining the value. Um, you know, for example, is it a business that can just be be sold? Uh, or is there a partnership agreement that says it has to stay within the family? Uh, does your uh, decedent who passed away, do they just have a very small share of the business or do they have a large share of it? Uh, there are a lot of considerations uh, about it. So if you work with an attorney, we can make sure uh, that we get an appropriate value on that business so that you are not paying too much tax on it, um, but also that it will be accepted by both uh, the state and also the IRS because the IRS does look at those values very, very closely. So sometimes we'll work with an appraiser, uh, but we know uh, very uh, good ones who are very adept at valuing those businesses in a way that it will be accepted. Another uh, tax uh, reason that uh, Dennis mentioned earlier is preserving that uh, ability to elect portability. Um, so again, that uh, portability is the feature in the law today that allows two spouses to get the benefit of both estate tax deductions. Uh, however, it's not automatic. Uh, in order to get that benefit, 
when one spouse passes away, the surviving spouse actually has to file a federal estate tax return where they elect that portability. That's the way to preserve it down the road. So again, that might not be something that is immediately apparent uh, because a lot of internet things out there today just talk about how portability is available, um, but it actually only is if you file the proper documents to make an election. Also to utilize that disclaimed property trust, uh, certain papers would need to be filed uh, in order to properly disclaim assets to go into that trust, or there might be other reasons that um, assets would want to be disclaimed. So there really are, uh, and these are just kind of a handful of ones that uh, came to mind as I was preparing today, uh, but there really are a lot of reasons why it can make a lot of sense to work with an attorney to help administer the estate. Um, while it might seem like an expense initially, uh, in the long run, uh, it can really help to make the process more streamlined and uh, to really end up being cost effective. Uh, and just one other thing is that sometimes it really can help to have an attorney be an objective third party involved. Um, even in the best family situations, uh, when a parent passes away, uh, it can happen where um, siblings might end up butting heads, uh, particular, particularly if one is appointed as the executor uh, and the others just might have concerns about that or, you know, they just want to make sure that everything is being done uh, correctly and as it should be. Um, so sometimes when there is an objective party like an attorney, involved uh, who can answer any sorts of questions that actually can help ease family tensions during that very difficult time. And, and an example of those family tensions is personal property mm -hmm. uh, uh, where, you know, the, the will, as it often does, just says my personal property will be distributed among my children. We always give the option of uh, and place in the will that if the uh, decedent or the testator uh, wants to create a memorandum saying where things will go and it accompanies the will, it should be given effect. Uh, but many people never get around to it, don't do it, and they figure I'll let everyone take care of that later. Uh, and you know, we're able to offer suggestions as to how to do that in a way that is fair to everyone, that doesn't involve one person, the executor saying, you get this, you get this, you get that. We create uh, a kind of a lottery system where individuals can each identify uh, three, five things that they want from an inventory of the estate. If there's overlap, we may choose lots. And then there's a rotation where people can pick something uh, from the remainder of the estate. So, and you know, that's individualized. We, we do that uh, on a case by case basis, but we're able to give, I think, some wisdom as to how to do that in a way that has the least invasion of people's feelings as possible. Um, and uh, unfortunately, a percentage of our state administration cases are what I would call repair jobs where individuals have tried to do it on their own. Uh, they went to the probate process and, and were able to get through that, which isn't that difficult. And then they kind of get confident. Well, I went to the courthouse and, you know, I got sworn in and here I go and I closed an account. And then they butt up against family discord. Maybe it's the personal property. Uh, they come up with a real estate issue that they just don't know how. One kid wants the house, the other kid wants it sold. Some people want money, some people want stock. They, they want it just transferred. Other people say, no, go ahead and sell it. And the executor, uh, and then they're starting to get notices from the court. You didn't file a status report. You didn't file the inventory. And they panic and come to us. So, I mean, we can deal with that, and we do deal with that. It usually is easier and more cost-effective to start it from the outset so that things move smoothly and there haven't been kind of the family consternation and the angst on the part of the executor who's now coming to say, "And can you clean this up? Uh, which we usually can, 
but you know, ask any carpenter. They'd much rather build a building from scratch rather than renovate something that's falling down. Uh, so uh, kind of a word to the wise. So what, what should the executor do with estate assets when uh, after being appointed? Uh, an executor acts in what we call a fiduciary capacity. And that means that that executor has a legal obligation to protect the assets of the estate and properly distribute them for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Can't look out for himself or herself, has to look out for the estate and the beneficiaries at large. So the executor upon appointment has to start acting with reasonable speed, with you know reasonable dispatch by collecting the assets, opening an estate account, getting a taxpayer ID number to hold the liquid property, getting the post office to forward the mail of the decedent, inventory the safe deposit box, uh, identify any real estate, make sure insurance is maintained on that real estate while recognizing that if real estate remains empty too long, sometimes six months, sometimes longer, but you've got to be in touch with the insurance company because they may not insure it if it remains vacant too long. And then you've got an asset that if it burns down, you've got no insurance. So you need to make decisions about that real estate and about how that real estate will be handled and transferred as quickly as possible. And sometimes in the estate administration process, that can gets kicked down the road. Sometimes that's inevitable because you can't sell the real estate because it's maybe not been in such good condition and you've got to fix it up before you can have any hope of selling it. Sometimes there are issues with title that it got passed down from one generation to the next. You've got to work to clear the title up. Uh, so there can be reasons why the real estate gets pushed to the end of the process, but there should always be a reason for that. And if there's not a reason to do that, don't do it. <laughs> get moving on it find out who's going to get it, find out if it's going to get sold, get a realtor and get the thing sold, get it on the market. Uh, stocks and marketable securities have to be identified and a decision should be made quickly. Are we going to transfer that in kind to the other beneficiaries or are we going to liquidate it? One of the most dangerous things an executor can do is simply do nothing with the stocks and figure I'll get to that later. Well, between 2008 and 2020, we've seen what can happen really fast to the stock market. And, and in that fiduciary capacity, the executor has to make that decision quickly upon being appointed. Am I going to liquidate this and put it into cash so I can be sure it won't go down? Or am I going to transfer it? Uh, and we have circumstances where all the beneficiaries, maybe there's three or four beneficiaries, and they're all in agreement. Don't liquidate it. We want to get that in writing. We want to get a recognition by the other beneficiaries that they are asking that the stock not be liquidated or that the stock be transferred in kind to them, if that's possible. Some stocks, that may prove to be a challenge. But some people want the stock itself. Some people want the money. That needs to be determined and needs to be done quickly because we have had circumstances and we, we've all seen them, those of us who work in this field, where executors have been surcharged, meaning personally held financially responsible for precipitous drop in marketable uh, securities where they just held on to them. You know, I handled a case where two charities, and this was the 2008 crash, and the executor absolutely insisted before they came to me about holding the stock and playing the market, and it crashed. Uh, and only through the grace of God what did those two charities who knew the executor and had warm feelings towards him, if they didn't, they would have had him surcharged, and he would have owed tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars because he did not liquidate it or get their express approval not to liquidate. It's an important issue and it's one that a lot of, uh, of people don't pay close attention to and it is a landmine if you don't. Leslie? 
Oh, no, I have the next topic. That's right. The next topic is mine, too. So I, I caught poor Leslie off guard. That's one of the things I do best in, in uh, <laughs> working together. Um, so the next thing uh, I was going to talk about was uh, that just very briefly, health care reform. Uh, one of the factors, especially for people with special needs, we do a huge number of special needs trusts every year. It, it's a subspecialty that we have been involved in for probably 35 years now, developing trusts for persons with disabilities uh, uh, and planning so that individuals with disabilities, or in some cases, uh, persons who are elderly, can qualify for medical assistance or Medicaid, as it's also called. And, and a special needs trust, as Leslie alluded to earlier, is so essential where you have a person with disabilities who may be a recipient of public benefits. What are the public benefits? Supplemental security income, Medicaid, uh, what are called waiver programs oftentimes for individuals to allow them to live in the community or to live in a group home that are funded through the Social Security Administration. Um, uh, group homes, uh, though, uh, sometimes people who are on uh, supplemental uh, food programs or, or uh, supplemental rent programs, it's important to them. We create special needs trusts primarily designed, they're primarily designed to, uh, to secure SSI and Medicaid, but also can impact all those other programs. And uh, it allows individuals with disabilities to have resources available to them to maintain dignity, to maintain a, a reasonable uh, standard of living while still getting public benefits that are absolutely essential to them. Now, <clears throat> an issue that sometimes comes up is people ask, well, uh, I can now get health care instead of Medicaid. Shouldn't I just keep the money, not have a special needs trust, and not rely on Medicaid? And it is true, uh, pre-existing conditions are no longer a reason to deny someone health coverage. However, the private health coverage that you get through what we call the exchange or the ACA, uh, Affordable Care Act, sometimes called Obamacare, well, whatever the, the phraseology you use is, to get that medical care that is now available. Uh, those programs don't cover group homes. They don't cover waiver programs. They don't cover nearly the level of services for people with disabilities that Medicaid does. Medicaid it, or medical assistance is far and away the best coverage that a person with disabilities can have. They may want to purchase if there's enough money available and a special needs trust can be used to purchase other insurance which may give better access to certain doctors or certain healthcare providers. But uh, medical assistance will pay for deductibles, for co-pays, and a wide range of programs. Better coverage oftentimes for drug and alcohol, for mental health treatment, for intellectual disability treatment, for in-home services for kids with disabilities with autism. So Medicaid should almost always I'd say 1% of the cases in my career have I said, yes, it's okay to let Medicaid go because of these other assets you have. And usually they're in the millions and millions of dollars. So uh, uh, the fact that you can get healthcare coverage through alternative uh, sources really should not, in almost all cases, preclude you from keeping Medicaid. Leslie? <laughs> Up, just a little more talking about special needs trusts. You know, something that we hear a lot is people coming in and saying, I read on the internet and I think special needs trusts are very restrictive. I can't use them for food or shelter um, and there's going to be a lot of restrictions on them. Well, if the trust is drafted correctly, under the law, that trust does not need to be uh, restrictive like that at all. Uh, like Dennis said, the special needs trust that we work on really is a subspecialty. 
and we are constantly uh, working with our state Medicaid agency and constantly reading all of the um, regulations and policies and new developments out there about these trusts. So we are able to draft them as broadly as possible under law. And uh, as long as um, you know, we do that, the trust really can be used very broadly to benefit the person with special needs over his lifetime. So the trust can be used uh, to buy a house for him if that's needed. It can be used for transportation, for schooling, for any sort of equipment, for um, a vacation uh, for him and the people that are needed to care for him. Um, you'll see things on the internet that say that these trusts can't be used for food and shelter. And it is true that if they are used for food and shelter, and if the person is getting a certain type of benefit called SSI, then there might be a reduction in the amount of monthly SSI that that person gets. However, it's a much more nuanced decision uh, because it often makes a lot of sense to uh, work with the trustee in charge of the special needs trust to still make that call to pay that food and shelter, have that reduction in SSI, uh, but it can, the trust can end up providing a much greater benefit uh, to the person with special needs. And uh, the trust could be used to pay for appropriate housing uh, and food for him. Uh, so it's something that as long as that trust is drafted properly, it really can be used very broadly uh, for the person throughout his life. And uh, the special needs trust can be such an important tool to enhance the quality of life for the person with a disability. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I think you've, you've touched the, the basis on that. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it really has been a, an, a remarkably gratifying part of our professional lives uh, here at McAndrews, Mahalik, Connolly, Hulls, and Ryan to do these trusts for persons with disabilities because we know that it allows them to have a, a fulfilling life rather than one that's based in, in poverty and indigency. They receive the programs that they require while at the same time being able every now and then to go to a movie or to go on a, a, a short vacation, uh, to see a ball game, uh, to have assistive technology, have a good computer, uh, to, oftentimes to have a wheelchair that really meets their needs. Um, uh, you know, we've seen so many times individuals struggling to get uh, medical supplies or assistive technology. Um, through insurance, whether it's Medicaid or private, and now the trust can go out and purchase it. Um, and, and it gives them dignity. Uh, and, and so many times family members have, uh, have just told us what peace of mind these trusts and the estate plan that revolves around the trust gives them. Uh, it, it's, it's just gratifying because oftentimes when people sign their documents, they walk out and say, I can't tell you how much better I feel that that's taken care of. And so we, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to serve and to, to work with people to do that. I would invite everyone to uh, check out our website, McAndrewslaw.com. We have so many articles about these issues, and we are going to be presenting more of these seminars about issues with related uh, with relation to estate planning and estate administration and special needs planning in the weeks ahead. Uh, we do that so that people can be empowered, so that people can make a good choice, so they can understand. Uh, how to be an informed consumer and take the steps necessary to get to that comment that I, I made when they walk out of the office and are able to say, I feel like a weight has been lifted from my shoulder. That's kind of what we also subspecialize in. So we appreciate the opportunity to have spent this time with you. Please check out uh, the website for uh, uh, this program if you'd like to see it again 
uh, also for our many articles, uh, our homepage, upper right hand corner, there's a link to questionnaires. If you'd like us to get started, fill out the questionnaire, uh, send it to us by email or mail, and we can uh, help uh, move that process forward for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.